and a new vegetable garden at the back. So enjoy Hillary's garden if I can describe hers verbally for you. So then it changes so clearly. Now before I go any further, I just want to thank you, Hillary, for joining me on the radio play program on Radio Blue Mountains. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I should say that I'm kind of very much a beginner gardener. I've only really had this garden for two years. And so I'm learning, but fortunately I'm surrounded by neighbours who know a lot. <laughs> so I pick their brains shamelessly. Well, for a garden that's only two years old, this is extraordinary. I'm looking at huge cabbages. <laughs> a, an incredibly lush row of garlic chives. Garlic chives, yeah. And chives and onions. It's an onion bed and rocket and... What are those called? Um, artichokes. 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 And in here is a protected garden. And what's in here? Lettuces. So, yeah, this is kind of more or less the greens bed. That the, the very healthy rhubarb, which is happy now that it's not being moved around the garden. Um, we've got lettuces, we've mm -hmm. got chilies, mm -hmm. um, and we've got various other salad greens. Okay. So, so this is um, a salad greens bed. Yeah, the red leaf sorrel, um, sorrel. Uh, um, is doing well. And um, there's some Mitsuna. Unfortunately, the Mitsuna, which I really like, because it's got a sort of slightly bitey um, flavour to it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it got eaten by the slugs. Okay, so, so you've got sawdust down to combat the slugs, I see. Sawdust down. The sawdust is not 100% effective, and I've had to resort to some slug pellets, which I really don't like to use, but, yeah. No. I had it a trick necessary. in my garden, um, which I mention quite often. That is, if there's a blue tongue lizard living anywhere in the neighbourhood, you invite its offspring to come and live because the Absolutely. offspring leave home and you yeah. make a little house for them. And the house I made is an upturned pot saucer turn, collecting water and a downturned pot saucer collecting right. water. Um, and the downturned one is sitting on a couple of rocks and that gives the blue tongue lizard a hiding place from the cats. Yes. Sorry, cats. Yes. Um, but since I put it in, I haven't had slugs. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I would love to have blue tongue lizards in my garden. They're probably around I here somewhere. Yeah. yeah, they'd be around somewhere. So you just, you just, you know, you build it and they come. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will give that a go. So here we've got looks like a um, zucchini. Zucchini, yeah, the very zucchini healthy is. zucchini. It doesn't have mold. Mold comes on mine. For yeah, mold does come on mine later in the season, but earlier in the season they seem to be okay. Ah, okay, and you've got a few more growing here. I yes, like yeah. Yeah, just um, this one's doing so well that I put in a couple more seeds and they seem to be happy. And this is in a herb garden. You've got you know, a really densely planted herb garden here of raspberries <laughs> and lavender and sage. Yeah. And it wasn't densely planted when I put them in. <laughs> But they've grown very enthusiastically and also there's a comfrey plant there oh. and I love it. It's a bit of a thug in the sense that it does tend to kind of expand and take over any space available to it. But it's a great compost activator. Absolutely. Fabulous. So just keep chopping the just leaves keep, and popping it in, yeah, into your compost. Yeah, just cutting it back and putting it in the compost. It's and they're really great good. under fruit trees. I don't know if you've got any fruit trees around. But no, unfortunately, I'd love to have room for fruit trees, but I don't. Yeah, I've got um, a miniature lemon, what they call a dwarf lemon. Yeah. And it doesn't take up a lot of space, but it's, it only grows to about this high, what's that, a metre, just over a metre, and a metre wide, and it's so abundant of fruit. Wow. Very abundant fruit. And do you have it in the ground or in a pot? No, in the ground, in at the, the ground. front, so the neighbours can come and help themselves, <laughs> which <laughs> they do. That's a good idea, yeah. <laughs> So you've got some tomatoes nicely staked here. Yes, a couple of, this one is a, they say it's a bush form of tomatoes. So mm -hmm. I haven't been um, taking out the kind of lateral growths on it. I've just been letting it do its thing. I don't know if that's right or not, but we'll see. Yeah, you've got some, um, you've got some little flowers going and I've been told that when you plant tomatoes, you don't feed it while it's growing, it's green, you feed it when it's getting its buds. Right. That's, otherwise you get all green and you don't get a lot of fruits. Yeah, that's, well, that's good. That's a mistake. That's last Which year's mistake. Know? Well, I'm getting some fruit, so... Oh, you are, yeah. Because last year I had a huge tomato plant took over my raised bed and hardly a fruit on it. Ah. So that was last year's mistake. 
And what have you got in here? Well, so you've got it all beautifully netted, haven't you? Well, we've got it netted because um, if we don't, the possums tend to come and eat. So the two things that eat, eat our veggie garden are the possums. Yeah. Um, and the other is the bowerbirds. The bowerbirds oh, love they brassica. Rocket. Oh, uh, they okay. love. I had this beautiful um, Cavallonero plant, and um, I thought I, I thought something. Was, I knew something was eating it, and I couldn't find any caterpillars. And then one morning, I saw Mr. Bower out there just stripping chunks off the leaves oh, and wow. eating them. And he got through quite a lot of it. <laughs> Cheeky thing. <laughs> so I didn't mind sharing with Mr. Bower during the period when you know we had drought and bushfires and all of that sort of thing. But after a while. The sharing got a bit unequal, so I netted it. Well, the, the bowerbirds really cunning in getting inside netting. Are they? Absolutely. Uh -huh. So last year I had my cherries trees netted, and then I went out, and somehow or other most of the cherries had gone. And and also for the plums, I had them also netted. And there I spotted the blooming bowerbird. He knew how to get in and under, and then get out again. Well, we've got all our netting pegged down. You have, but um. Yes, uh, I shall stick to that plan. <laughs> and one of the mistakes, you know, this my my garden's all about mistakes. Um, wow, this is is this dill? This is dill. Yeah, oh, that's a huge dill. This is a two meter high dill. This, <laughs> but one of the mistakes I made was I um, something was eating my lemons out the back, yeah. and so I think it was the wallabies coming up during the drought. So I netted it, but I used net that was a quite a fine net. And just as the flowers were coming out, so the bees couldn't get in. Oh. And then, so I didn't get lemons that year on that particular tree because I was fine like this one and, and this. And the bees can't get through it. So if you've got anything that you, you want One's pollinated. For, yeah, pollinated, absolutely. Um, then at the pollination time, like fruit trees, but you don't, you're yeah. not doing that. You've got huge cabbages <laughs> with, with no white moth because you've got them nicely netted. Netted, although I did notice there was a little white um, butterfly inside there, ah, that netting. Okay. How it got in, I don't know, but... Yes, because you've got it pegged down very well. You've done a thorough job of this. Oh, here's a sneaky way. Oh, yes, in. look, something's got in there. Yep, something's worked its way in there. Sneaky. So you've got it... Um, that you've actually got it on a base as well. Most most of the nets that I see, people have just poked the this conduit yeah. into a curve, but you've gone beyond that and you've actually made a proper structure. Yeah, well, my, um, my partner made a proper structure. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it does help. Yes. It does help. And then behind you, another raised bed. Looks like potatoes. Yes. Oh, wow, lots of potatoes. Well, I came from, um, I emigrated to Australia in 1985 from England. And in England, we used to get these lovely potatoes, first early potatoes, that uh, were okay. kind of very young and new and had hardly any skin on them. And they tasted delicious. And I haven't been able to find them in Australia. So I decided I'd have a go at growing some. So where did you get the rootstock? Um, they're just ordinary King Edward potatoes from... Oh, OK. Yeah. So, okay. I'll see. I've just harvested my first plant. Mm -hmm. And I think the lesson that I learned is that, that the, the potatoes grow from the stem of the plant that, and you need to earth it up. And I did earth it up, but I could have earthed it up more and got more potatoes, I think. Right. But, you know, as you say, you learn something every year, yeah. don't you? Absolutely. And you've got a tumbler composter. Is that your main compost? Um, got a tumbler composter, but also a bin composter. Oh, OK. The tumbler is very good and it works really quickly. Um, just got to make sure that you get the balance of because that's mostly food scraps that goes into there, so the balance of wet stuff and brown stuff. Can I look in? Yes, of course. Um, I love compost hips. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, my goodness, that's very so lush that, looking. Yeah, we've, we've taken some out of that, and then we need to take the rest of it out. I think it's pretty much cooked. How long does it take to cook? It depends it is, how much circular tumbler. Yeah, we put this one here because it's getting lots of kind of sun, and mm. um, this one only takes a few weeks before it's ready to go. And do you have depending to turn on it every day. Do. Yes. Does it take a bit of muscle? No, no, it's not. It's not difficult at all. Mm. And so then the other side's got. Oh, I see. You've got one cooking and one one cooking and one one ready. Yeah. Right. Hey, that's a neat system, isn't it? 
good. But it, when you turn it, it turns both. Yes. Yes. And then you've got a compost heap down the back here. Yeah. The compost heap down the back. That one we've just emptied and put in the front um, garden because like everywhere in the mountains i think the soil is pretty sandy yeah and so the more it's quite hungry it seems mm. to me the um the more compost and other stuff that you can give it yeah i can't better. create enough compost either yeah and so i've got my system is garbage tins because i get rats or antichinus i'm not sure what they are and they come in underneath and eat it or, or food so I've got rubbish tins that I put a hole, several little holes at the bottom to let mm. the water out and the worms in and just use a rubbish tin on the oh, ground okay. near the fruit trees. Plant them near the fruit trees. Well, thank you for looking, letting me see your wonderful edibles. It's a pleasure. And, <laughs> thank you for joining Radio Blue Mountains. <laughs> Again, it's been great. You've been listening to Green so Thumbs on Radio Blue yeah. Mountains. But before I go any I'm further, Susan I just Smith. want to thank you, Hilary, for joining me on the radio play program on Radio Blue Mountains. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I should say that I'm kind of very much a beginner gardener. I've only so um, in honour of the two gardens that went with falls, I'm going to play Vaughan Williams' The Lark Ascending for you to enjoy as you contemplate the way in which the gardeners in the Blue Mountains adapt to whatever they have and garden in so many different ways. So Hilary's gardening is at the back, a beautiful vegetable patch, and Terry's garden throughout the whole garden is an exotic garden that's um, so filled with plants that I can see barely a weed. So enjoy this, and I'll look forward to talking with you again next week. So you've been listening to Green Thumbs with Suzanne Ricks on Radio Blue Mountains. Bye for now.